Okay, so welcome everybody who's joined us here today and everybody that's joined us online all over the world on Zoom and on the live Facebook stream. Um, welcome to Kindred Spirits. Um, first and foremost, welcome to Kindred Spirits Ireland 2022. And the idea behind the Kindred Spirits um, celebration here that which started this morning at the Kindred Spirit Monument, designed by Alex Pentec in um, dedicated to the Ch uh, Choctaw Nation, who um, in 1847 um, sold what belongings they had after they had, came to, they had come together in conversation and heard out after they'd heard about the Irish famine. And they came together, the nation had suffered their own um, tragedies just only uh, uh, over a decade previous um, on the Trail of Tears when they were forced themselves to leave their own lands along with their, uh, other nations and to travel over thousands of miles and to lose, to be, that forced march forced them to lose a quarter of their nation on the way. And uh, they lost many other, uh, many more of the people after they had settled as well. And yet with all this tragedy, they still managed to have compassion and empathy in their hearts and to be able to hear of a strange people uh, on a, in a place they've never heard of before, oceans away in another, another part of the world, and to hear of their plight, and then to think, you know, with the empathy that they had, and to remember the suffering that they had, and then to come together in conversation, and to say, we need to help these people, because it was the right thing to do, and because they didn't think of themselves at the time. They thought these people are in trouble, and these people are suffering, and we know what suffering is, and we need to help these people, we need to reach out to them, we see them, and they were, the only nations of, of all the people that did contribute towards uh, the Irish famine at the time. Um, there was a lot of other uh, individuals and groups that did contribute, but the Choctaw gift has been um, a gift that has stood the test of time with the Irish people, and that's why Alex Kindred's, Alex um, Pentex uh, Kindred Spirits Monument was dedicated to the Choctaw people in 2015. And, Following on from that, even though the gift wasn't forgotten, um, we've had opportunity along the way to uh, realize and reflect as well. Um, you know, over the last two years of the COVID uh, epidemic and or pandemic and the suffering that was starting to reach all of us all over the world, basically. But um, we all had um, a similar and shared pain, basically, and suffering. But um, it was when the Irish people heard through um, a tweet, which, which was basically tweeted out first and foremost by Erin Yassi, and um, it was an Irish reporter herself that um, picked up on the tweet and re retweeted it to uh, the Irish nation and the Irish people. And straight away they realised that they had an opportunity you now to reciprocate the original gift of the Choctaw nation. And so they reached out and they saw that the suffering of the Navajo and Hopi people Due to the um, due to the COVID is, is one thing we were all suffering with the COVID, but the Navajo and Hopi nations, among other nations, were suffering um, far more um, more more suffering and far more. Um, it was more indignant suffering in the sense that uh, they they were being watched by their own you know their own leaders in their own country, their own governments, and they weren't being assisted in the sense that they should have been in a time when. The Choctaw Nation saw that another nation that they'd never even laid eyes on, never heard or spoke with, other than the few that they'd met in their own lands at the time, that they could reach out and in empathy and reach out with this gift and think about generations ahead. And yet, when the Irish people thought they see the suffering today, they reached out in their droves and started to help out in the Navajo people and the Hopi's people. And I'm sorry, no, I'm very nervous today, so don't take any notice of me. Um, I don't want to go on too long. The fact is that the gift here that uh, originally started and has now continued to be paid forward has um, started today, Kindred Spirits Ireland 2022, and it's the main idea behind the idea of behind the celebration that we started today at the, at the monument was to come together and share thanks and celebration and um, 
the main uh, celebration was it was something beautiful to witness and it was something very special for all of us today and i think that for a lot of us and a lot of people that attended they still don't even realize how special that moment was and um it'll it'll be in time that we will all look back and remember how special that moment was just as we now look back and remember how special the gift of the shotgun nation was originally um so without further ado i just want to thank you all very much Thank you all for coming and everyone online. And I would like to now turn it over to Chief Phil Lane Jr. for the opening prayer and a message to the people of Ireland. Thank you. Okay. Good morning, Doc Yeppe, my very beloved relatives. I want to extend a very, very heartfelt uh, embrace and give my love and greetings to all our beloved Irish relatives, as well as other members of the human family who have gathered together to celebrate kindred spirits. And we are kindred spirits. I've had the great honor over the years to study Irish history and compare that with our indigenous peoples here. And we truly are, truly are, uh, truly are kindred spirits. So I would like to open with this prayer. And in fact, you know what I'd like to do, if I may, invite my dear sister, uh, Ejna and my sister, Joan, if they would do the opening prayer and song. It would be very good. And then I'll share a few words, if that's possible. Thank you, my precious brother. Um, I'm facing this direction, but in order to see my brother, it's to the right. <laughs> so if I, I can see that I, I'm facing that way, not too much. <laughs> so let me, I would love to give our prayer. Um, I need to get the distance here so I don't kill any ears. But because we are embedded in our glorious universe, and so we want to acknowledge always this, because we haven't really uh, humanity, you know, we don't really realize this fully yet. So I want to do this prayer for us. Gracious, most beloved creator, source of all life, source of the very breath that comes into us each time we breathe and we don't even have to remember to breathe because your great spirit and the ignition of our very lives comes with each breath great creator and all the masters of creation be with us and guide us we also invite and invoke the spirits and the forces of the four directions, east, south, west, and north, in all of their great majesty and glory and teachings. And we also invite the great above, the great below, and the very center the very center source of ourselves, which is always, always connected to the very heart of creation. We invite all of these masters, and we also invite our beloved ancestors throughout all of time, the ancestors of all of our lineages who have lived and had great joy, but they also had challenges and that right now because humanity is in a great suffering and has known great suffering and so the prayers we know that we are the answer to their prayers right now and because humanity right now is in a dire straits in relation to our beloved mother earth and to all of our other ancestors 
that there are many species that are being extincted right now because of human action and inaction and ignorance, that we invite all of our relations to be with us and to guide us. And we most, most importantly, ask that our beloved Mother Earth <laughs> more fully embrace us, that we know of this embrace consciously, consciously, and that our hearts be united in the great love, the infinite love that Creator and our Earth have for us, because we are so beloved, but we do not yet fully know this. So we invite and invoke inspiration and the great brilliance of the implicate order and the intelligence of the entire universe to be with us and to guide every moment of our time together for the wonderful kindred spirits of Ireland because we are here for the highest purposes of love and the unification of our family and as Chief Phil Lane has often and is um, invoking that we gain peace on or before 2030 and with the end of war by 2030. So thank you. I'm gonna talk with say, and so it is, Oshay. Amen. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, that's the spirits about the home for today. Planting a seed the way we dance, planting a seed the way we plant our corn, beans, and squash, planting a seed the way we plant our potatoes, planting a seed the way we plant our trees, and becoming like them. And so with this in mind, as we plant the seed here today, as an initiating memory of a kindness come full circle and spiraling up to the next level so that we can engage this in the world beyond ourselves. Right? I offer you this song that was made for me by a, a Chippewa Cree man working with the Blackfoot a well-known song maker, now some time deceased now, whose last name was Kennedy. And this song is a tree planting song. And with this song, I intend to plant our consciousness in our commitment to global peace to global respect, to global love, to global unity. Is it starting with the indigenous people? Well, not surprising. Can it be limited to us? No chance. It's gonna take every one of us. So I offer you that, and I don't need this for that. to acknowledge the medicine that's been brought in by the prayers of my sister, Ashna. And I want to offer those protections in the best I want to acknowledge the East. I want to acknowledge the South. Thank them for being here. And I want to acknowledge the West. The relatives are there. And I want to acknowledge the North.
Don't acknowledge the above. The sky in which the trees are rooted as well as they are rooted in the ground. The one that the ground. And that puts me in a circle that is safe and secure and whole on the vessel. That's how this is. So we're making a safe space.
I encourage us to hear the beautiful words of our brother, Phil Lane. Mm -hmm. Amitaki Epi, my very, very beloved members of our human family, especially our beloved relatives of Ireland. I'm so thankful to be here at Kindred Spirits because it reflects the very, very essence of what our human family needs to do at this time in our history. So here we are at this time in which our indigenous people across the Americas and many others have long prophesied that we would leave behind our adolescence as a human family and step into our spiritual adulthood. And they call this the day that shall not be followed by night. And I can't think of any better way to begin this process in unifying our human family than to have this beautiful time with our beloved relatives of Ireland. Because together, we have truly become kindred spirits through our suffering that we've, we have gone through. We can look clear back to 1649 in the massacre of Dor Dor Gohinda. I hope I'm saying that right. Uh, when 2,000 of your relatives, men, women, children, were massacred, and the same words they used kill them all, nits make lice. The same thing happened. The same words were used in the Americas when they undertook massacres there. But that didn't stop us, because I don't want to dwell on that part. That did not stop us from keeping moving forward and retaining our languages, the Gaelic language, and your earth and nature-based customs and culture through oral traditions of Gaelic. And as yourselves, we originally had no written language. We told stories and great storytellers that we share together as storytellers. But I think it's this human suffering we've gone through. But along with that, the deep spiritual feeling and understanding we have about life that caused the great Choctaw nation to feel the suffering of those relatives when one million, can you imagine one million members of our human family starved to death and it could have been prevented. In fact, it was meant to be by others, meant for those relatives to starve as it was for us when they killed all of Buffalo. So we would starve and hopefully surrender. And I want to say that I'm so thankful that you're holding on to your language, your ancient language. It's so important. We can have both speak whole numbers of languages, but it's very important that we do our best we can to learn and know of our cultures, because that's what's given us strength to rise to this day. And I'm so thankful that you have reached out and supported the great Hopi and Navajo nations. They too have gone through their challenges. In fact, the great Navajo people, Dene people, they had their long walk as well, where many lost their lives. So we have this common understanding, and I think it comes because of the understanding from our side of the prior unity and oneness of our human family, that we are one human family with beautiful, diverse cultures, but we're one. And just like one of our elders said 
when they were signing a treaty and he felt they were kind of looking down on us, he took a knife and he cut his, his hand and he said, my blood is red. Your blood is red. We are both human beings. And so here we find ourselves at this time in history. And we've come back strong, despite all the challenges, all the oppression. It's even made us stronger. And now we're reaching out across this great ocean, making relatives. And from our understanding that when we're born in this physical world of time and space, each of us is born a sovereignty, ancient, <clears throat> and perishable, and everlasting. And so, Mitakiepi, we reach out to you. And I'm so thankful my dear sisters, Ezna and Joan are there, and all the relatives who have come from Navajo Nation to further deepen our relationship. And I hope during this year, we can further deepen our relationship. And I, I had this a good opportunity to, to uh, be on this wonderful program called Press, Press Conference with Jamin, who's there with us as well. And James, who I got a chance to meet and all the other relatives. So I would say this, that our vision, our goal, because we have united across the Americas, because prior to the coming of our relatives from around the world in 1492, especially Europe. And by the way, to me, this was all to be. The world is round. We as human beings have a great curiosity about things. We have this natural part of us that wants to know. And so it was natural that we came together. It was natural we came together. But now after we've been together now over 500 years, and by the way, it's so interesting to me, about 80% of all the foods being eaten in the world today came from the indigenous peoples of the Americas. And so it was potatoes, by the way, that actually came from the Americas here. So it was so interesting as well, I'm gonna add this, that along with the loss of 1 million relatives, can you imagine what it's like to see your children starving before your eyes? 1 million relatives, 1 million starved to death. 2 million left and went to Canada, the United States. And it's very interesting because of the commonality there was a lot of intermarriage between the Irish and the indigenous peoples of the United States and Canada, as well as the French. And so you have to, in, for instance, Montana, you have a lot of Irish who are now called Métis. That's a mixture of indigenous Irish or French. And they've taken, and you should see, I'll tell you, they're really good fiddle players. They can play that Irish fiddle and do Irish jigs it's really amazing. So the Irish culture also came here. And also we are part of that because I love to go to the Métis gatherings where they're doing their Irish jigging and playing Irish fiddle. But that also came out of the potato famine that brought us together through the great gift, the Choctaws. And also I wanna to remember too, the Ocheti Shikoan, the great Sioux nation who also right after the massacre at Wounded Knee. By 1892, we're sending gifts to the Chinese relatives, to others, just like the Choctaws, because as the Irish people who have deep feelings for their families as we do, we care about those people who are hungry. We care about those relatives right as we speak today the more millions upon millions that are going into extreme poverty, we care about that. So I really, really looking forward 
to, to um, further visiting. And I enjoy, invite you to join us in our vision, which is we see the foundation of this issue is the understanding of the prior unity and oneness of the human family, our intimate relationship to all life, and the hurt of one is the hurt of all. And the upliftment, the healing, the empowerment, the honor of one is a healing, empowerment, upliftment, and honor of all. Basically, with that understanding, our goal is unify our human family. That doesn't mean oneness. It means unity and diversity. Unify our human family. End war and begin peace by 2030. So me talk yepi, my beloved relatives, we are a time of choice. The path leading to further war, streams of po wealth and poverty, all those things we can see around us growing. Or as our elders tell us in our 16 principles for building a sustainable, prosperous, prosperous world, Stand in the strengths you have. Move the positive alternative you, you wish to create without, without giving your, way, your energy fighting the negative. And that's what I think we need to have together. And we have this. We know we want a world of families close to each other, relationships. The things that we know from our traditional cultures that now we want to make it global. We really, what we need today is a Byron Baru whose focus is unifying our human family and in a spiritual, loving, kind way. I really enjoyed, by the way, enjoying, have enjoyed reading and studying Irish history, as I believe we should learn and understand all people's history, and then we'll understand each other a little bit better. So I thank you so, so much, so much for this opportunity to be here with you today and that we might at all times have moments of peace to think peace be peace and i'm going to close now myself a little prayer and a song as i think that it's time to really realize that there is a part of us a soul that's beyond this world of time and space, and that each of us is born a sovereignty, ancient and perishable and everlasting. And that foundation of this universe we live in has a spiritual foundation. And it's true, it's not going to be through weapons, it's not going to be through bombs, it's going to be through our spiritual prayers and our understanding of spiritual, the spiritual world that's going to fulfill for sure, without question. All our sacred prophecies. Otun Kashla Wakantaga, creator of the universe, most beloved one, all powerful one, most kind one, most compassionate one, ever forgiving one. O ancient of days, O blessed beauty, we call upon your holy power at this time in remembering all our ancestors who have gone to the other side camp, who are close at our closest vein. We might open our hearts and minds to their guidance, our creator's guidance, but our relatives, we acknowledge you. And those yet to come, we acknowledge you. And we ask, creator of all good things, O oh, Holy Spirit, that we might be the best examples possible for the future generation, especially elders. Our elders, it's time for us to awaken, to arise, become physically, spiritually, emotionally, mentally in the best happiness we've ever been. To be role models for our young people. That, there, that no matter what we face, we've faced it before even more difficult than we're facing right now. In Tukashila Wakantaka, we call upon all the tribes and nations of the East to come together in unity and harmony and honor our Irish relatives, to honor this gathering, to bless it, and to give thanksgiving, to see this healing take place between our relatives of the Americas in Europe and the beautiful island, Emerald Island, Ireland. 
We constantly call upon all those tribes and nations of the South from where comes new life, especially remembering today the great Navajo Nation and all the relatives there and all the relatives of the Hopi Nation, all those Southern tribes and all the South too of Africa, wherever they might be in the world. We ask their blessings. We ask for their healing, but we ask for their blessings on the great Irish people that we truly, truly come together with one heart and one mind and many bodies in unprecedented unified action to heal our Mother Earth, to end the abuse of our children in any manner. In Dekashlova Kantaka, we call upon all the tribes and nations of the West from where comes thunder, lightning, and rain. We call upon those spiritual powers of thunder and lightning and rain to awaken the hearts and minds of the people in a good way, in a kind way. To the realization, it's time. All those sacred teachers and Lord Jesus Christ says, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So let's all know to come together and create this unity, create this relationship through this having a good visit. And so we give thanksgiving to all the tribes and nations of the West. In the North from where comes the white snow, the purifying white snow might purify our hearts and minds. So we only see oneness, respect and honor between us. And that our minds might also, they might also honor our great Irish relatives in this great gathering that from it might have great outcomes to, to unify, to begin this movement for unity. In Kashla, we give thanksgiving and respect to Father Sky, all the masculine elements of life. We ask forgiveness as men for those awkward ways we've walked that have led us to this place we are now. And we now as we know in our old ways, our old cultures, was always that respect of women. We always respected women. And we, we understood the eagle has two wings, one is man and one is woman. That we may truly balance things out. And that sacred feminine might flourish so that we might truly be eagles, one wing woman, one wing man, and fly to the greatest place that we've been prophesied to do so. And we give thanksgiving at this time to include our mothers, our beloved mothers, and a beloved Mother Earth from whence we came, especially our homelands. Beloved Mother Ireland, beloved Mother Chaco Canyon, Beloved Mother, Great Plains, Black Hills, wherever we may live. And we give thanksgiving to our mothers who have brought us forth through great suffering as we are going through a birthing at this time. And so with this, we give great, great, great thanksgiving for this great gathering and ask that everything that occurs here that this time we've taken to pray that everything unfolds so beautifully that everyone who needs to meet each other be guided to meet each other. And that from this, a movement together forward, putting our energies towards the positive without giving our energy, putting away, fighting the negative. If that happens, Peter, we ask that in a good way. I want to conclude with a prayer that was shared with me many, many years ago. It also comes from a Christian Judaic uh, lineage of, of today. A prayer for unity. Then I'll close with a traditional way we close as to go to people. <clears throat> oh my God, oh my God, unite the hearts of thy servants and reveal unto them thy great purpose. May they follow in thy commandments and abide in thy law. Help them, O God, in their endeavor and grant them strength to serve thee. O God, leave them not to themselves. 
but guide their steps by the light of knowledge and cheer their hearts by thy love. Verily, thou art their helper and their Lord. How? Shunkmano he medo, shunupa he medo, how we chant it? My names are Shukmano and Shunupa Sapa, and I stand responsible before the Creator for my words and actions. I'm going to say this last thing, like my dad used to tell me. He said, Son, if you can't day be happy today, what day you have, what day are you waiting for? So may this day be the happiest and most joyful ever. It's time to joy for the long winter time is over. The new springtime is here. The prophecies have been fulfilled. We're now fulfilling and actually stepping into the future of what they prophesied. Hallelujah, Chante Wash State. Again, thank you. Aho. Thank you, Chief Phil. Thank you, BJ. Um, we've changed up the order just a little bit since Silas has a hard stop at the bottom of the hour. Chief Phil, thank you so much for all your leadership. We need you now more than ever, and you are so constant and such a dear brother and friend and leader to us all. Thank you. And thank you, Joan and Ejna and all of our dear guests who've traveled from the First Nations from the Americas. I want to introduce briefly uh, next uh, Susan Hargreaves, who will introduce Silish. And Silish, thanks for hanging in there with us. Susan Hargreaves has been active in the animal protection movement for 43 years. She has been an undercover cruelty investigator, a direct action organizer, the first to emigrate it to the United States as a humane educator and author. She has been spreading kindness to all species with her founding of animalherokids.org and Veganza Animal Heroes series, which she was kind enough to make a stop from her global book tour here in Cork, Ireland. And with that, I pass it to Susan Hargreaves. Susan, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jamin, for that lovely introduction. I am so pleased to be in Ireland, go, going on a bus through the countryside. And I was pleased today to be at your ceremony that was beautiful, celebrating kindness, kindness to all. That's two-legged and four-legged. And uh, the, uh, the Began's Animal Hero series is about being kind to all animals. And it's the first world's first vegan superheroes novel. And all of the funds goes to the education work that I've been doing for 43 years. And that's three programs in the schools about being kind to all. And we need your support at animalherokids.org. We unite youth and we empower all ages to be animal heroes because all animals deserve to live free of harm. Two-legged, four-legged, finned, furred, or feathered. So I'm really thrilled to be here to introduce Dr. Silesh Rail, whose granddaughter is a wonderful member of our Animal Hero crew. And um, I'm sure you've heard of climate healers and the wonderful work they're doing educating the world about going plant-based to save the planet. Um, his, his pinky promise to his granddaughter is by 2026, the world being vegan, because we cannot afford to wait any longer. And Dr. Rayo has been um, working with Al Gore at one point, trying to convince him to go vegan many years ago. So it is my pleasure to introduce, I'm uh, proud to call my colleague, Dr. Silesh Rayo, who has the answer. 
we all have the answer, and that's to go vegan and get that message out in a positive way to be kind to all animals, including us human animals. So take it away, Dr. Rail, and thank you so much, Jamin and James, for the opportunity to speak to everyone today. Check us out at animalherokids.org to volunteer and take it away, Silash Rail. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susan. Um, I thank you for that very kind introduction. I have to first acknowledge that I really don't have all the answers, but I am an engineer by profession. And as soon as we admitted that we are changing the climate of the planet, we entered a new era in human history because for the first time, we now have responsibility for harmonizing and maintaining the climate of the planet. Because as soon as you admit that you're changing the climate, you own the climate of the planet. So, uh, and when you have a task like uh, harmonizing the climate of the planet, which has very measurable objectives, uh, it becomes an engineering project. And in an engineering project with 8 billion engineers as team members, in any engineering project, you first start with systems engineering, which is what I do. I'm a systems engineer by profession. I've been working on climate change for the last 16 years. I started out in this area thanks to Al Gore, for which I'm always eternally grateful to him. And uh, I have been looking at this from a very, from a systems engineering perspective. And I see that what we are undertaking today what we have been undergoing so far is a birthing process. We are birthing a new species of human beings, a new version of us, a homo ahimsa version of us, as Judy Carmen calls it, which is a version of, uh, which is a non-violent caretaker version of the human species. And to do that, uh, I had, you have to do a systems engineering analysis on the impact of human activities on the planet. And I have been doing that and I have a model. So this is one of the first things we do as engineers. We model the problem. So we have a model that's based on uh, a baby in a bathtub, as the analogy. And uh, I'll be going through it in more detail in the first conversation among the three-day Gardner conversations on Wednesday at 10 o'clock uh, Irish time. So I'll go through it in more detail, but basically uh, the message I wanna to give to you is that there is a solution that I see, at least according to my models, and there is a way out and it involves giving nature a free reign to solve the problem so that we, and harness nature to be on our side as opposed to constantly fighting nature. So I hope to see you all there so that we have uh, uh, more time to talk about how do we go about doing this and uh, get a conversation going around this. So thank you all so much for your kindness and for your generosity and for inviting me to talk to you all. And I'm uh, so glad that you're doing it there. We had a gathering like this in India where we spoke about ancient medical sciences and technology and how we need to revive all our ancient knowledge and update it with the modern environmental circumstances. So all our ancient knowledge is still valid, except we have to update it for the modern circumstances. And when you do that, you clearly see that veganism is a pillar on which we need to rest. Um, veganism and yoga, which is looking for happiness within ourselves, as opposed to constantly looking for it outside. So these are the two pillars of a new civilization we need to build. And thank you for, for doing this around the world. Uh, we are planning to start a vegan university in India centered around uh, yoga and uh, ahimsa or veganism and 
And I'm glad to see a similar effort happening in Ireland. And it's a pleasure for me to join you from across the oceans. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Silas. All right, continuing, we have next uh, Jessica. Hello, good evening, good morning, yate, yate, bine, wherever you are in the world. She Jessica Stegonishia, but Anishle, those that got ambushes chain, Ki Anni Dashache, are those that got a Dashanella, De Teen Dent Nasha, are do Sharan A. Bishnel de Sita. Uh, Shama A. Lula Stegel, ye, Dosh J. A. Phillips Stegel, Jr., ye, and Aunt. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Jessica Stegel. I am from the um, Folded Arm Clan of the uh, Dine people, I'm born for um, from the Cliff people of the White Mountain Apache tribe. Um, my maternal grandfather is Kiani, which is the Towering House Clan. And my paternal grandfather was also White Mountain Apache. Um, I'm from a small community called Tisto, Arizona, on the Navajo Nation um, in Dineta. And I'm also, um, I have a home in Winslow, Arizona. Um, and so we are here this week in Ireland um, as a group. Um, I'm one of the 12 co founders of the Navajo and Hopi COVID-19 uh, Families Relief Fund. Uh, we started the organization in 2020 in response to the pandemic and the impacts that we were worried about it having on our communities on the reservation. Um, and so I just wanted to um, go into a little bit about why we came here to Ireland um, as part of our culture. We um, we wanted to express an appreciation for the gift and the kindness of the Irish people uh, when we were in desperate need in 2020, dealing with the pandemic and also um, having to deal with a lack, a severe lack of infrastructure that would care for our people. And um, my team members that are here um, will go into those details. Um, I just want, kind of wanted to start the story a little bit with why we started the, the, the fund and the organization. Um, it was a very frightening time for us. We, I live in Winslow, which is um, just off the reservation, about 10 miles off the reservation. And I saw, you know, because of the pandemic, people were panicking, they were purchasing food and water and toilet paper, which nobody knows why. <laughs> Um, but the shelves were empty in the, in the stores. And knowing that my relatives would be traveling 50 miles one way to get food and water um, and necessities, household necessities, including PPE, um, they would find the stores empty and have to keep coming back every day to try to find when they could purchase those um, necessities. So we thought that we would start by those of us who lived off the reservation would start purchasing and storing food and water um, in our homes so that we could have that available when people came to town. And that was sort of a, a smaller um, vision that we had because we didn't know what was going to happen. And in the year to follow, um, and with the support of the Irish people and people all over the world and in the United States, we, um, we actually grew that fund to over $7 million and we were able to um, provide food and water to over 500,000 families. And um, I think that one of the things with the conversation we're having today, um, 
and we were able to visit the Kindred Spirit sculpture, the beautiful town of Middleton, and the people that we were able to be in community with today just really made me think about the, the conversation around coming together as one to, um, to really face the challenges that we as, as human beings are, are gonna be um, facing over the next uh, year to, to however long we're still here. <laughs> and um, I wanted to say that what powered our organization from facing this threat, um, this monster, that could potentially, um, um, you know, wipe out our people as Diné people. Um, we were, we came together and we saw throughout our communities um, what we call eh, which is kinship. It's about caring for one another. It's about knowing when somebody needs help without having to be asked and, and stepping in to help that person. It's about um, coming together when you know somebody's experienced a loss and pooling resources to support that family, to support those people. And that's what uh, is. And while every single day we're, we're brought up with that concept, um, I don't think we really, really ever sit back and understand what that actually means. And the pandemic, with the through the pandemic, as we go back to that, we, we saw that in action. Um, we mobilized people, we mobilized our communities. Um, our volunteers were there every single day and still remain there if, we're, if they're needed. And um, it really, you could see this thing that we all knew about but didn't, couldn't actually describe, couldn't actually see it, and we saw that in action. It's called ke, ke, ke. And I think that that's what the world needs today. And I think that that's why, that's why we're all here. And I think, and this, this gathering reminds me of the meetings that happen when somebody experiences a loss, when there's, you know, a loss of an elder or a loss of a, of a child, um, the entire family comes together and meets and has discussions about what they're going to need. Um, making sure that the the, the uh, family feels supported, um, but also that they have um, that they are they're given that time to grieve. They're given that time to think through um, what needs to happen and and to um, give reverence to the to the people that they lost, but also giving them the strength to get through that time and so uh, giving them a chance to just be with themselves and with the, and with their new life. For, uh, for four days. And so I'm really glad to be here today. And I just wanted to explain that to you. And um, the rest of my team members are gonna come up and they're going to um, explain what uh, the organization did in 2020 and then also um, where we are going forward from here. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, Yad Ash Shindin Herrera Yanisha, Tachini Nishle Nakai Bashishin, but Anita Shiche Nakai Dishinella, Ahot Ao E Dinet Zanisha, Auto Sebian Disguide Denasha. Hello, everybody. Um, it's really a blessing to be here. My name is Shindin Herrera, and I'm um, from Monument Valley, Utah, on the Navajo Nation, and I'm also one of the founders of the Navajo and Hopi Families COVID 19 Relief Fund. One thing that I wanted to talk about uh, today is a, a question that we're all asked a lot. Um, you know, why did we have to come together and start a relief fund for our communities? Why was, um, you know, why wasn't this kind of response to the pandemic already in place? Um, you know, especially in our communities where, you know, we are on land that is, uh, 
you know, we have our tribal government, state government, and federal government that we kind of operate under. Um, so why was it that Navajo was so vulnerable um, when COVID started spreading? And why didn't we see such a quick response from, you know, other entities? Um, and so I think that it's important to kind of understand uh, the state of the Navajo Nation. Um, and so, you know, I think that when you think of our land base, you know, we our land base is over 27,000 square miles. So that's, you know, our land spans into Arizona, New Mexico, and Utah. And, you know, we have over 400,000 tribally enrolled members. Um, we have about 170,000 people who live on the Navajo Nation. And, you know, families on Navajo have consistently worked to preserve our language, our culture, and, and our, our lifestyles. But when you talk about a global pandemic, you also have to remember that the land that we call home has long been a national sacrifice areas. Um, particularly in my area, you know, we have a lot of uranium mining and on Navajo, there are still over 500 of open abandoned uranium mines. And so you talk about the health disparities and equities and the, um, you know, underlying health issues that made our people so vulnerable. Um, you know, Northeastern Navajo is a site of multiple coal-fired power plants that contribute um, you know, the greatest amount of air pollution in the Americas. And so when we saw COVID spreading, you know, myself and, and our founders knew that this would be really, really detrimental to our communities. And so why we started the GoFundMe, why we knew that we needed to be the source of food, water, PP, and other resources for our, fa our families, um, is because, you know, we know our communities. We know that 30% of households on Navajo lack running water and electricity. We know that 40% of the Navajo Nation is a cell phone dead zone. So even accessing, um, you know, services like an ambulance, contacting the police, contacting any type of help is really challenging for our families. Um, and we also know that seven, over 76% of households on Navajo experience food insecurity. I mentioned the large land base we have. Well, on that land base, there are only 13 grocery stores. Um, so, you know, it's already incredibly difficult to access resources for our people. And so what this meant for us is that instead of trying to um, wait for outside help to come, we knew that the way we would get through this pandemic, um, we would rely on, you know, the resourcefulness of our people. We would revert back to um, our matrilineal society and how our women were the leadership within our communities. Um, and this is what happened with our relief fund. Um, what we call our organization now is Yeha Onido, which in Navajo means may our people have fortitude. And so through this, um, Jessica talked about this, um, this concept of eh, that is why we did what we did, why we continue to do the work is that, you know, we're drawn to this work um, to protect our communities and the most vulnerable and high risk in our communities because we know that historically, you know, we have experienced in environmental racism, we have experienced a lot of challenges that have less, left us vulnerable. And that is why our organization's mission and goal is to be pandemic proof, to be, to go back to our old ways. And when I say old ways, I mean, you know, living off the land and being self-sufficient. Um, and I think that we were able to ensure and work towards ensuring the survivability of our people um, because of you know the generosity we were shown um, by people around the world um, particularly from ireland um, you know we uh, jessica mentioned we raised over seven million dollars on gofundme one million sixty one thousand six hundred and eighteen dollars came from twenty nine thousand six hundred and sixty donors in ireland and so we saw this support um you know to our relief fund to help us 
purchase food, water, PP, haul wood for our elders. Um, and I, being located in Monument Valley, was on the front line doing that work, you know, and to see the families we were able to help on a daily basis, uh, knowing funds came from Ireland and, and to be here today is just absolutely incredible for myself and for our whole team. Um, so I just want to uh, say thank you um, and to continue these conversations and these relationships because I've seen firsthand how beautiful this work can be when we continue to uplift and support each other. Um, I'd like to invite uh, Vanessa up next to talk a little bit more about the mission of our organization um, and the work we plan to do going forward. Yeah. Yeah, good evening, good morning, good afternoon from, from us here in Ireland. Um, my name is Vanessa Tuli Yate. Vanessa Tuli and Shakia Ani Nishlan Tatnazani Bashish Chin Twitsuni Dushate Tolini Dushanella. And um, I am from Winslow, Arizona. And you might have heard the song by the Eagles uh, standing on the corner. <laughs> um, I currently live in Phoenix, Arizona at the moment, and I operate a home care agency. Um, so my focus has always been on the elders and making sure that they have trained and certified caregivers that um, are able to meet their needs so they can continue their retirement at home in the comfort around with their families present and hopefully you know with the support of their family members as well um can you pull it up one second so i wanted to speak more about uh our nonprofit that we started as a result of this relief work and again this would not be possible without the contributions and the support and the belief that all the donors have in our team. Um, we did this work out of necessity, and unfortunately, we weren't able to rely on our Navajo Nation government to assist us. Um, they also set up a GoFundMe, and they have not yet accounted or spent uh, $6 million that they still have in their account. Um, and just more recently, with the funding that we got from the COVID CARES Act and the Hardship Act, um, it took them a whole year to decide to allocate the $1 billion that they had. And that could have been easily used to support our people. We have lost over 1,800 um, relatives to this pandemic. And 60% of them are our elderly. And they are our knowledge keepers. Um, they hold our cultural teachings and our language. And with the way um, our reservation is set up, we're, we're not set up for long term there on our lands. Uh, we have um, several uranium mines that are set up around Navajo. It has polluted our waters and made many of our people sick. Uh, we have the highest rates of diabetes, cancer, high blood pressure issues, and this was all exacerbated by the pandemic. So that's why we wanted to act quickly. And um, so the work does continue with our board. And our vision is to empower our Diné people with the fortitude to overcome challenges through ego, which is um, a principle of self-reliance. You know, you can do this yourself. You can pick yourself up by your bootstraps and make something happen. And also, which Jessica mentioned and explained earlier. 
And our mission is to build collective Diné power to exercise our inherent Diné rights to determination by um, putting our Diné cultural values and teachings into practice to rebuild community into a distinctly Diné society. And I'm happy to report, as I mentioned before, that the work does continue. Our director, Ethel Branch, was unable to attend. Um, she is currently campaigning to run for the Navajo Nation president, and we are <laughs> in full of support of her work, and we're hoping she wins this primary election to continue on to the general election later um, this year. So I would like to ask for your support in our work. Um, we have several funders, um, one of them being uh, the Kellogg Foundation and also, um, I'm drawing a blank here, I'm sorry, I'm still adjusting to the time difference and I'm really tired at the moment. But, um, what is her name? Oh gosh, Mackenzie Scott. <laughs> she had relieved us of so much stress. Um, I believe she gave us $10 million to use at our discretion. And at the midpoint of the pandemic, we were going through sleepless nights. We were worrisome. And we were concerned about, you know, how are we going to get next week's delivery out? Um, it, we spent up to $50,000 a week on deliveries. And we had set up multiple distribution sites. So that was our biggest concern is to continue providing that support to keep people home and safe. Um, so if you are interested in uh, donating, we do have a website. Our website is NavajoHopeSolidarity.org. And you can also find us on social media under Navajo Hopi Families COVID-19 Relief Fund. And I, I'd like to thank you all for attending and supporting us today. But yeah, and I'm gonna pass this on to Mary Frances. Yat eh. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Yat eh benedo atlenado e My name is Mary Francis. Ye e dinet ha cheat ni nishle. Ado trapaha pa shishchin do look at the shiche. Ado tlizathana e da shinale. And, um, I'm originally from the Copper Mine Inscription House area, but I reside in Page, Arizona. Um, most of you can look up uh, Grand Canyon or Horseshoe Bend or Lower Antelope Canyon. That's where I reside. Um, but I just wanted to um, share with you guys um, how grateful and you know our our gratitude um, as you know Navajo and Hopi families uh, COVID nineteen relief fund. Um, for the generosity of the Irish people. And, you know, um, the ladies have shared um, a lot of, you know, information about our work and how we began. But we would like to also share what our, um, you know, our future projects would be. Um, currently, um, we are working on long-term sustainability goals for the communities on the Navajo Nation. We uh, currently started, well, maybe almost a year now. Um, we um, started the community center in Monument Valley, um, Utah, and it's Tsebi Nziske Community Center. That community center offers um, programs to uh, the community members, you know, elders, youth, 
um, there's so many different um, programs and workshops that we, you know, want to offer and um, uh, to the to the community. Um, but yeah, that is our um, our goal is, is to continue building these communities and helping them have um, easy access. Um, just as anybody else in the United States or anywhere else, there's easy access to, um, you know, technology. Um, uh, so that that is our goal. Another thing that we would like to do is um, offer um, food sovereignty, you know, teaching the children, the youth, um, how to plant the way that our ancestors had done, our grandparents had done. So just stringing the generations together um, and making um, this work and rebuilding our communities because who else is gonna do the work? Who else, you know, has stepped forward? And, and there's, you know, there's minimal. There's a very few of us that are conscious of this, these issues that our people um, have encountered. And not only the Navajo people, but the Hopi people, you know, the Irish and many other tribes back in the United States have these hardships. We all encounter our hardships as um, indigenous people and you know, we just really, and I just like to say that um, thank you for giving us a voice at this co pre press conference. Thank you for um, making us feel heard. Um, and it's important that we learn this, we unlearn, um, it's important that we unlearn um being content with being pushed back being silenced thank you for giving us that voice and um we will move forward and i hope that we um touch your hearts and you everyone has heard our message and understands where we come from. And we hope that we can make that connection with you. And uh, And for our families and our friends back home um, that are wondering what we're doing out here in Ireland. Um, the Hawade, the net hatte, Chiyan, the Nahas ni do trota, Benahas ni. A call A D G A, um, Shant Navajo and Hopi families COVID 19 relief fund, the Linigi, A D G A yab and ye at Hikri, Ado has tweak, Kujin has Tanigi, a kindred spirits, the Lina, a call A. Nation. Irish Gia A Shimpichi Yatastin Namasi Shia Hatsatastine Oko Beso Gibahatendo 
Thank you so much, ladies. Thank you very much, Mary Frances. I didn't understand your your native language, but I'm crying all the same. All the way. <laughs> Um, I'd like to know that just we have two uh, on online. We have uh, two recordings. Uh, they couldn't be here today, so I'd like to um, first to introduce you to um, Turtle Bunbury, who um, has been a great help and uh, in the organisation, and he's um, a great writer and has been, um, you know, a great um, promoter of not only the Choctaw Nation story but also in the. Um, you know, in this story of the actual plight of the Hopi and Navajo, Navajo's people as well during the COVID pandemic. So we'll, we'll have the turtle bun, bun Thank you. Good day to you all. Uh, I'm very sorry that I can't be here for this very special event, but I'm actually traveling overseas today, which probably means that I'm stuck in an airport possibly the wrong one with my luggage in another airport, possibly on the other side of the world. Uh, such the challenges of the world that we live in today, that a person can be one side of the world and his luggage the other side of the world within a few short hours. The world was not always so small. Uh, when a devastating blight killed Ireland's crucial potato crop in the 1840s, it took uh, many weeks before the horrible rumours were confirmed over on the other side of the Atlantic in, in North America, uh, many people did remarkable things to try to alleviate that dreadful situation in Ireland. Uh, individual fishermen sailed across the oceans with cargoes of wheat from places like Cape Cod. Uh, another took an entire warship uh, from Boston laden with food and clothes and brought it into Cove or Queenstown as it was in County Cork. Help came from all sorts of unlikely quarters, the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, uh, the circus man P.T. Barnum, the French celebrity chef uh, Alexis Soyer, all sorts of people, but the most remarkable of all uh, was the donation collected by the Choctaw Nation uh, in Scullyville, Oklahoma, on the 23rd of March, 1847, just over 175 years ago. As an Irishman, uh, I express deep thanks to the Choctaw Nation for their uh, generosity during that uh, traumatic time. I'm also pleased that the man who collected the money, uh, Major William Armstrong, was himself an Irishman, uh, whom the chief of the Choctaw Nation described in 1847 as our father and our friend. Major Armstrong and his uh, brother Frank and their wives had all uh, a long-standing connection with the Choctaw Nation as they were helping them during and after the infamous uh, Trail of Tears era. That bond uh, across the latitudes between Ireland and the Choctaw Nation has gone from strength to strength in the ensuing 175 years. It is now over three decades uh, since Don Mullen invited Chief Hollis Roberts to lead the annual famine walk in County Mayo on the west coast of Ireland. We have had so many links uh, since then through the chieftains, through Mary Robinson, the former president of Ireland, 
through the plaque to the shock tour nation uh, that's up in the in the mansion house the lord mayor's house in in dublin city uh, in 2018 the then t shock leo vradka he visited durant in oklahoma we had during COVID that uh, the reciprocal generosity, if you like, of the Irish to the people of the Navajo uh, Nation and the Hopi Reservation uh, during uh, at the height of COVID. Uh, and then we've had these events, events like T.C. Crawford's Ripple in Time in 2020, uh, the Harvard Alumni Allyship event in 2021, uh, and now this fabulous event. Um, and indeed, we even have an exhibition of shock tour stickball players participating at the World uh, Lacrosse Tournament in Limerick uh, this August. And of course, we have Alex Pentex, a magnificent sculpture, Kindred Spirits, an absolute gem to me, uh, which uh, also gives its uh, fine, its name to this uh, fine conference and celebration. It is all part of our collective thank you here in Ireland for the help that the ancestors of the Choctaw Nation provided and the wonderful ongoing serendipity uh, that this has generated between our two peoples. I applaud this circle of giving. I celebrate the possibilities of unity in the face of division, of generosity to conquer adversity. And I wish you the very best with this event. Hi, this is Claire Daly, MEP, joining you from the European Parliament here in Brussels. And it's a great regret to me that I can't be with you personally. But I'd firstly like to really thank Kindred Spirits for doing me the honour of asking me to be present and to take part in this wonderful celebration. And I'd like to extend a warm welcome to everybody here, especially our friends from the First Nation and Native peoples of the Americas who've made such a long journey. Of course, we all know what this event is about. It's to mark an historic gesture of solidarity from one oppressed people, the Choctaws, to another, the people of Ireland, while we were suffering our terrible catastrophe on Gertha Moore, the great famine of the 1840s. And, you know, I think one of the things that really stands out about this decision was that the Choctaw people took it so soon after suffering such a terrible catastrophe of their own forced displacement along the Trail of Tears, and that they could still find a reserve of generosity after this really contrasts with the inhumanity of the colonial assault on Native America and indeed the English administration in Ireland. You know, it's not for me to speak for them, but I can only imagine that the Choctaw people, because of their experiences, very easily understood what is so often misunderstood, that the famine in Ireland wasn't a natural disaster. Indeed, famines rarely are but actually a consequence of English colonialism in Ireland. And I mean, that is why this gift, I think, has to be seen as not only an act of generosity, but an act of understanding, of solidarity and of resistance to a common system of oppression. So why do we remember? It is, of course, to learn the same lessons again. These two catastrophes that precede the Choctaw gift are two of many that litter the histories of occupied peoples worldwide. Only a few years before, for example, the British Empire had just withdrawn from a spree of incredible violence, theft and bloody murder against the people of Afghanistan in the first Anglo-Afghan War. None of this has ever really ended. Today, another great hunger is visited on the people of Afghanistan where 22.8 million people face acute food insecurity. Again, that hunger is no accident. It is a man-made catastrophe, the consequence of a vicious regime of sanctions, a barbaric memento left behind from the most recent European escapades in Afghanistan. And of course, there are many more examples from all over the world. We mustn't allow ourselves to forget any of them. So how, how can we honour the memory of the Choctaw gift 175 years on? 
How can we pay it forward? The only answer is by remembering the lessons it teaches us about solidarity, by remembering where we came from and by doing our best to emulate it. Friends, I wish you all the very best for a wonderful celebration today and continued solidarity and friendship into the future. Speaker, Mr. John Doyle. I, I know Joan Henry and others are going to be really angry at me because this is this is my prep. It's not great. Just, this is probably better. Is that okay. <laughs> Oh God, uh, where to begin? I, actually, something struck me. Uh, we, we spoke earlier about bringing the, the ancestors back into our ambit. And I was shocked here to remember that my father's favorite book was Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee. I, I, that, that came back to me from nowhere. It's unbelievable. Anyway, I wanted, my, my role is probably a bit of a party pooper. People have spoken about the terrible things that have happened in the in the past, and there's this there's this um, uh, there's a feeling of hope. I want to dash that hope. I want to take the hope from you, and give you the opportunity to live without hope and without fear. I'm not saying what I'm going to say will happen, but it's the best it's the best I can do as a scientist modeler, climate expert. Most of what you think you know about climate change is wrong. Most of you think that we have a couple of years to do something about 1.5 degrees and there's a guardrail and electric cars and all sorts of nonsense. We're already at 2.2 degrees globally averaged above pre-industrial. The 1.5 nonsense you hear is because they shifted the baseline. Ronald Reagan had the same approach to, um, to poverty. It was incredibly easy to remove millions of people from poverty. He just changed the definition of poverty. So already at 2.2 degrees this year, probably in October, and if not this year, next year, the year after, we lose all the ice in the Arctic Ocean. Losing that ice is the same as when the last piece of ice in your drink melts. The, you know, the drink has been an ice temperature the whole time during the party, and then the last bit of ice melts, and all of a sudden it's warm. The same amount of energy it takes to melt a block of ice at zero degrees to a puddle of water at zero degrees. You put the same amount of energy into the puddle of water at zero degrees. What does it do to the temperature of the water? Uh, how much do you think it changes? Does it go up one degree, two degrees, half a degree? It goes up 81 degrees. So we have at the North Pole is this giant lump of ice that just absorbs all the excess heat that we're putting into it. And even with that, we're racing in an exponential curve, as Paul Beckwith will, will talk about later. When that ice goes, it will add as much heat to the system as human beings have ever done. So I'm telling you that within five years, we'll be at about four degrees above where we are now. Sorry, we'll be at about four, four degrees above pre-industrial, just due to that ice effect. And there are lots more effects. Human beings go extinct at three degrees. Now, all I'm talking about, this is my mental model. I'm an engineer, I'm a scientist. I've worked in the European Commission on Climate Change and stuff for many, many years. Uh, I'm not speaking on behalf of the European Commission, I'm speaking for myself. But I've had access to the politicians, to the plans, to the schemes, to the, to the wonderful COP conferences. Did you know that after every single one of the COP conferences, the amount of emissions goes up? If you, if you were looking at the world from the outside, you'd look at it and you'd sort of say, 
they should stop having those bloody climate conferences because every time they have one, you know, the amount of stuff goes up. So maybe they should stop doing it. I, I, I was, I've been, I've been very shaken by all these wonderful women who've, who've, who, who have, who have connected to something that's far deeper than, than what is purely technical. They've managed to go beyond the prefrontal cortex. They've drilled through my limbic system down into my, down into my reptilian stem and somehow found a way to connect to the whole human being. Um, I can't tell you what will happen. I can tell you, statistically speaking, mentally speaking, as a scientist and as a modeler, you're out of here within 20 years and there's nothing you can do about it. Given that there's nothing you can do about it, then everything remains to be done. There comes a time when you sit with your mother, as I did a couple of years ago, holding her head as she dies, where you realize she's going to die. So you stop running around getting medicines and you know, pulleys and stupid things for her bed, and you spend time. You connect. Now, I can't, I don't know, maybe Jon Snow's dragons come back and suck all the CO2 and methane out of the air. No, nobody. You know, all I can do is give you my mental model. I'm a part of the reality. I change it as I speak. So we don't know. I mean, I, I'm not all of reality, but I can tell you that this is any dispassionate scientist who's not being paid to stay comfortably in his zone, writing careful academic papers that always end with, now is the time to start cutting CO2 emissions. Anyone who is not tenured and depending on saying this sort of standard thing will tell you what I've just told you. They'll tell it to you privately. You won't see it written. And if there was anything we could do, would we do it? Um, you've heard the wonderful Silas Rao talking about veganism. But two things Irish people could do to help with what's happening. We could stop eating animal byproducts. That would be wonderful. We could, we could feed the entire country on what I eat. You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm one of those sandal wearing, lentil eating Egypts of vegans. You could grow everything we need in North County Dublin and let the rest of the country over to the trees that are supposed to be here anyway. We could ban private car transport. Who the bloody hell needs private cars? Come on. Those two things are the only things we can do and they're the two things that our politicians can never do. I'm not blaming them. I'm not blaming the farmers. I'm just saying that appears to be what our species is and does. We're not going to address this problem. We're going to go extinct. That's not necessarily a problem. You were always going to die one day. That day is probably sooner than most of you expected. So what I take from these wonderful people, what I take from these marvelous women, what I take from this event is the time that you have, start using it as if you knew you were going to die because whether you believe me or not, you are. It's not a question of belief, it's a question of what happens, it's the way the universe unfolds. Every moment you have between then and now is a moment that's important. What would you like to do? Who would you like to be with? I know who I'd like to be with. I know the people I want to be in contact with. I know the conversations I want to have. And they're not about technically adjusting Ireland's, you know, uh, emissions from the herd from 22% to 15% and maybe adding a few electric vehicles and hoping nobody counts too well because that's what we normally do. That's what everybody normally does. I'm an expert in political speak. I spent a lot of years in Brussels. So that's my message. It's a bizarre one because it's one of hope. Because what these women have done for me in particular is something really strange. They've shown me, not the future, but they've shown me that the past is what we create now.
The past is a ship moving through a sea. The ship is now and we'll move through the now and we leave a wake behind us. That's the past. And for some bizarre reason, I have the strangest feeling that what we have done is reclaim the extraordinary agony and misery of our famine times and maybe of a number of trails of tears as well. Somehow what we're doing now justifies, justifies and makes great the sacrifices of the past generations who I feel to me are closer now than they have ever been. That's it. Thank you so much, John. That was uh, refreshing uh, and shocking at the same time. Nobody ever accused me of being refreshing. And shocking at the same time, of course. So uh, that was fun. Um, well, fantastic for me because it's a breath of fresh air to some, hear somebody actually speak the truth, and people need to realise that the truth is there. So um, I will, without you know, without going on too far, I'm going to leave it if. We have been joined by Paul Beckwith, I'm, I'm assuming is joining us uh, via Zoom link. So please, by all means, Paul, take it away. All right. Um, Professor Stephen Salter, is he, is he there, BJ? Yes, he is. Okay, as 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 way of an in, as way of introduction to Professor Stephen Salter, so what John mentioned about the dire situation of the planet and the exponential overheating, as it turns out, there is a solution on the table for exponential planetary overheating. Two questions come to mind: Will humanity actually implement that? And per earlier conversations with John, even if we do implement it, will humanity screw it up and then take that as license to continue uh, other horrific practices, basically saying, oh, well, problem solved. So, um, so there are myriad derivative conversations that follow from what we're about to hear, but without further ado, I introduce a, a man for whom I have tremendous respect as he has dedicated a large portion of his life to solving the very problem that uh, John just talked about. Professor Stephen Salter, thank you. Is that showing up properly on your screen? Yes, it, uh, it is. We don't have the first slide, but we see um, the first slide has a tiny little dot. Yes, we we see it. Okay, down there. Right. <clears throat> well, that little dot represents uh, the all the energy that's used by humankind in oil, gas, coal, solar, photovoltaic, a whole lot all together. And uh, let's go down. There it is, annual world, all forms of energy. Uh, <clears throat> this is coming from BP and um, it, it's a very good statistics. But here is the solar input uh, coming to the earth every year as well. Okay, and that is about 9,000 times more than all the human energy consumption. And that means that uh, quite a small adjustment to the solar input could solve the problem. Now, at the moment, well, the, perhaps it's a little bit uh, out of date now, but the, the Julia Slinger, who was the head uh, scientist at the Hadley Center, uh, says that the present problem is about 1.7 watts. That's a rather dim torch bulb. 1.7 watts per square meter of the earth. That's our problem. And the uh, mean solar input to the whole earth is 340 watts per square meter. 
which is very conveniently 200 times more than the problem, which means that we only have to change the reflectivity of the Earth by half a percent. Okay, just half a percent. Now, uh, let's look at this slide. And you can see that the, um, I've got added here the dates of all the COP meetings, and you can judge for yourself how effective the aspirations and the promises and things for the COP meetings have been in the slope of this graph here, which is the carbon dioxide concentration. And you can see that it has continued to accelerate upwards uh, since Keeling started measuring it back in 1958, I think. And the policy at the moment is to, uh, to cut back the, uh, the emissions to zero. And um, the problem with that is that you're going to have all the CO2 that we've released up to now, plus all the CO2 that we emit between now and the time we get to zero. So getting to zero would be a very, very good thing to do, but it's completely inadequate. It would just stop things getting worse. It wouldn't make them any better. Okay, so we need to think about ways in which we could uh, find re reductions in the solar input to stop the temperatures rising. Uh, we certainly need to try and get rid of extra emissions, and we also need to find ways of scooping the CO2 that we have already emitted out of the atmosphere. And the third thing I think is going to be feasible if we can understand enough about marine biology, because there are things like giant kelp that we can grow and we can encourage the growth of phytoplankton, which are very fast taking CO2 out. And we can find ways in which we can get this material right down to the bottom of the sea where it will be eventually made in coal or oil in, in years ahead. Um, so there's three things that we have to do. Stop emitting, suck it out, and do some direct cooling. And the way I want to do direct cooling, amazingly, has connections with where you are in Cork. Uh, and uh, if we look at this map here, you will see we've got clouds over different parts of the earth. And you also see that in some places, the clouds are whiter than other places. Here's a nice white one, and here's a darker one. And uh, this is a very interesting phenomenon. And this chap here, who was born in Cork, a chap called Sean Toomey, uh, was able to study it. And uh, he was able to fly over clouds and measure the energy coming down from the sun above and how much was being reflected back up from underneath uh, with the clouds coming back up. And he could also fly into the clouds and scoop drops of the, of the cloud and measure how many there were per cubic centimeter and how many uh, um, the, the sizes of them. And he did lots of work on, on, on this. Uh, and he showed that the reflectivity of a cloud uh, depends on the size distribution of the drops. The, the, the complete range of reflectivities is really very high. It goes from about 25% to about 75%. Remember, we only want to change the reflectivity of the Earth by half a percent. And uh, Tumi produced lots of algebra about this. It's fairly heavy going, uh, but fortunately you can prove that it's, uh, the effect is there by looking at the reflectivity of jars of glass balls. And this jar's got glass balls that are four millimeters in diameter. And these ones are 40 microns. So there's a hundred to one difference. And the, the numbers work out that if you can double 
the number of drops in the cloud for the same amount of water, the reflectivity goes up by about 5%, a little bit over 5%. That's a useful calculation to do. The real ones are perhaps a bit more complicated, but you can show the effect here. Uh, this is showing various ways of measuring the reflectivity. Uh, here we've got what's called albedo, which is the same as reflectivity. And if it was 0.1, it would mean that you were reflecting 10%. Um, we can do, may also measure this in terms of the top of atmosphere reflectivity. This is at the cloud top. We can also measure it in terms of the global total albedo. And we can also measure it in terms of watts per square meter. Remembering we've got about 1.7 is the problem at the moment, uh, probably going to be going up. And the way you use this graph depends on the, 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 the fraction of increasing of number of cloud condensation drops here. So if we were to double the number of cloud drops, uh, we would get, we would find out, so we'd, we'd um, go up to the slope here and we will get this red line of the reflectivity of the clouds and the change in watts per square meter. And this is a, a log scale here. So the first bit's quite easy. We could get about a 5% change in albedo for doubling the number of drops in the cloud. But if you wanted to go to 10%, we'd need to have four times the, the number of drops. So it's easy and it gets a lot harder. So what we need to do then is to uh, think about ways we could use this. And the first chap to think about this was uh, this fellow here called John Latham. And he thought that we could uh, increase the number of drops in the cloud by increasing the number of things called cloud condensation nuclei. Uh, you can't make a cloud drop without having a tiny little seed to get it started. Okay, and uh, salt fragments that are left over from the evaporation of a spray of filtered seawater are almost the best material you can have for making a condensation nucleus. And John Latham knew about Toomey and he knew about nucleation and he did some calculations and worked out how much water we'd need to spray and what size of drops uh, we would need to offset double the pre-industrial CO2. And he was amazed at how little water uh, this would, would take. If you get the right places at the right time, it's only about 10 cubic meters of water a second. And this, de this calculation depends on uh, what the present condensation nuclei is. And you can see there's large areas of the oceans at different seasons, which have about 20 or 20 or 30, 40 uh, uh, condensation nuclei per cubic centimeter. Well, I was trying to find a way to make the sea evaporate faster by uh, increasing the uh, squirting drops of spray into the atmosphere. Uh, John Latham heard about this and he telephoned me and said, could I make the spray for his project? And I was a bit overconfident and said yes, but uh, I've been working on it since about 2004. And we really can do this. Uh, the equipment to do it would look like this. These are boats, these are ships which are drawn by the wind. Uh, these are rather odd sails, which instead of being like an airplane wing or a textile, they are cylinders that spin, they're called Fletner rotors, and they give you enormously powerful thrust. And these are being driven by the wind. Uh, they're not, these are not floating, they're flying. These are wings called hydrofoils here. So we've got four hydrofoils uh, being dragged through the water and we're changing the pitch of the hydrofoils so that you can get an up force here and a down force here and a, a, an up force here and a down force here. And we can use this, these motions to drive hydraulic rams to give us high pressure oil, which we can convert into uh, pressure water that we're squirting out through nozzles here. And 
to provide enough uh, change in the solar input to save the ice in the Arctic, we'd need about 50 boats like this working just for a couple of months in midsummer. Uh, and we could also uh, reverse about 20 years it would take, we could reverse the, 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 the deep heat in the oceans. Um, if you know the rate of ice loss for the Arctic, it's about 25,000 tons of ice every second over the year. Um, and you can work out, you know, the density of ice and you know the latent heat of ice. And so you can work out how much reflectivity increase you need just for the short time in the midsummer to, to, to offset that amount of latent heat. And the numbers are really not impossible. Uh, if we wanted to do everything, you know, ice, uh, deep ocean heat, glaciers, Greenland, we would need about 800 of those boats. And uh, at the moment we can, well, we'd lose our jobs if we told what it really costs to make anything, but we can compare the cost of these uh, with the cost of uh, ships <coughs> made similar numbers. The best example is the corvettes that were used in 1940, the Royal Navy, and they cost £60,000 in 1940, and you can do an index linking of that to today. You can also look at the cost of very similar machines. The nearest I can find is the JCB Earth Moving Machines, they cost £8,000 a ton of material. And we can also look at the costs of Oxford PhD graduates. And in 1940, the annual salary of a graduate was uh, £600 a year. We can use this. If you do all these, it works out that these ships will cost about three million each. So if you want to buy 800 of them and borrow the money from the bank and pay it off, we find that the, uh, the it's quite quite affordable, so uh, we can choose where and when. We can particularly target warming water when there's a tornado or a um, uh, no a hurricane or a typhoon. We, we can't do tornadoes. We can do hurricanes and typhoons, and we can keep the surface temperature of the sea to what's going to be comfortable, and we can tweak the temperature gradient across the Indian Ocean, which affects the way monsoons and droughts uh, uh, go. You can get the balance between Australia and Africa for uh, the amount of rainfall and the amount of bushfires. So um, we need a bit of engineering to do this, but the designs for this are nearly complete. Uh, and I would like to get uh, bright young engineers to point out my mistakes and improve the, the design and so on. So there we are, uh, and it all started in Cork. <laughs> Can I try to answer any questions? Hello? Hello. I Here comes Jamin. I believe uh, we're Oh, I was just going to reiterate to the room, if there are any questions, feel free to grab a microphone or come up here and ask Professor Salter any questions you may have. Thank you. Great. And maybe you could um, stop the screen share. Right. Okay. So stop share. Yes, thank you. Okay. But I'd like to show you I these have things. have a question. They're these jars, right? 40 microns, four millimeters. Right. Yes, go I ahead. Have a question. Greetings. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> it's wonderful to talk with you directly like this. My name is Eshna. My question is Have you been able to present this to any uh, groups or governments or companies that are interested and are investing in this at all as yet. I have sent papers about this and calculations to everybody 
I can think of. And uh, I uh, have been told uh, by the UK government department, um, BEIS, that I mustn't write to individuals, officials in BEIS. I have to send papers to uh, an inquiries desk. And uh, the inquiries desk do not acknowledge papers that I um, have sent them. And I've been told that uh, there's this sort of work is against present government policy in the UK. There are people working on this in Australia, and there are some people working on the theory of it in America. Uh, but at the moment, um, the only money in the UK is coming from a, a, a gullible old age pensioner's life savings. Um, I'm the gullible old age pensioner. Uh, I think that it's criminally stupid not to explore every possible method. Uh, and uh, we fortunately had some quite good results from climate uh, modelers in Norway who can show what the, uh, the patterns of uh, humidity change and rainfall change and temperature. And it's very good at saving the ice in the Arctic. And it also, gets useful increases in the really dry drought stricken places and I've got maps that I can uh, show you for that. So the answer is um, not much official enthusiasm. Uh, I'm trying hard and maybe if you know someone who's got some money to spare and wants to take a risk, uh, the return on investment is really pretty pretty big um, and uh, we could solve the whole problem for about half the cost of the Chelsea Football Club. Um, so people who don't like football clubs but want to invest uh, know what to do. Can I, I'd like to ask a further question. Mm -hmm. Well, actually there are a response and then a question. Uh, I would think that going through any governmental agencies would be like molasses and glacially slower, <laughs> too slow. Mm -hmm. So it would seem that it would need to be from the private sector that would need to seek any kind of support for this yeah and then the second thing is do you have any like small models that you know where you've tested this in some kind of a small model so uh, that, um, it's, anyway it's very yeah. difficult to test this uh without actually uh, making some spray um we've got the the algebra to work out how the contrast of change and if you do this um, you, you you can't see the result the the, the to, to get a five percent change in reflectivity is below the contrast threshold of the human eye what you can do is to take a hundred different satellite images and superimpose them and then you can see the, the contrast change that you need and this could be done with quite a small spray system uh, which could be working from a small island, preferably one with clean air coming in and going out, uh, somewhere like the, perhaps the Faroe Islands. And we could learn a very great deal about it from a small thing uh, working for at least six months and preferably a bit longer than that. Uh, we could do quite a lot of tests in, uh, inside a dustbin with a tiny little spray system and we could prove that we can filter the water well enough and we can make the right size of spray and that all those calculations would work. So we can do a lot in the lab and the design of the ships allows us to have each of the separate functions tested in the lab indoors. And you, you go on uh, doing um, indoor tests until the, the, the system is working as you thought it ought to work. 
Uh, so we, we can do quite a lot with not very much money. Um, and uh, I hope we can get bright enough young engineers to, to, to do this. We have another question online. Is she'll have to unmute. Her name is Suzanne. Go ahead, Suzanne, if you come on screen. There you go. Hi, um, Professor um, Salter. I live in Switzerland, and I know that the government in, of Switzerland are looking desperately for solutions. And I like just that you know um, that I might be a receiver of your idea here right. in this country. I put my email here so I can con connect you if you agree. Yes, certainly. Do you agree? Uh, let me just get something to write it down with. Um, so we have another question for Stephen Salter. Hello. Um, I'm just wondering, I was looking at uh, that uh, Bill Gates is releasing a lot of his fortune at the moment to try and help the world. Is there any way of contacting someone like him? Or like uh, people like yes. I, I've actually had two days of meetings with him. And uh, this started after the, uh, the, the, the terrible uh, hurricane and they were interested in ideas for cooling the sea. And I um, suggested one, and he was quite interested in that. And uh, he decided, however, to fund people in America. And I can quite understand that he'd much rather have money being spent um, closer to home, where he can keep an eye on it. Uh, one of his technical advisors has been very supportive and has helped me and suggested uh, uh, useful uh, uh, design solutions. So it's possible, but at the moment, I think he would want to uh, to keep things in America. He was also bitterly attacked about this uh, idea we had for the hurricanes. This was a way to try and cool the sea surface temperature. And a lot of people said he was trying to run the climate as well as all the computers. And he was very badly upset by this and hurt. Uh, and he didn't want to go into that again uh, w without a lot more defense. Uh, I was very impressed with the work he was doing for, on malaria and polio, and I wouldn't want to have him not do any of those things. Um, and what about Mr. Uh, Richard Branson or any of those types of people that are in the UK? Again, there is. I tried Branson as well. He had a competition, and the, I got a letter back saying there'd been so many ideas suggested that they couldn't read all of them. Um, so, <laughs> uh, but, but Branson uh, also had an arrangement where if you make it now that worked, he got control of it. Um, that was a small print of the competition that he was having. Um, and uh, yeah, I wouldn't mind handing your things over to someone who's going to use them properly. But uh... thank you. Has, um... Has it ever crossed your mind that perhaps the time for wealthy, elderly white men proposing techno solutions has passed and that this is a yet another delusion? We've had meetings before. My name is John Doyle. Yeah. I find much of what you're proposing offensive in its complete lack of sensitivity to uh, the tradition of people like you and me causing more problems by proposing solutions. I've picked holes endlessly in what I consider to be a ridiculous proposal. I'm not going to go through it again. But the tenor of this meeting was one of listening to, to the voices of those who haven't been listened to. And once again, you're proposing to us that Bill Gates, Richard Branson, you and God knows who else, the British government, are going to fire stuff into the air and everything will be all right. There's a fundamental change in mentality that has acquired, not another illusory techno fix. As I say, I said this before, you haven't answered any of my questions on dimethyl sulfide and the natural production of, of, uh, of, 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 the, of the tiny grains around which seawater forms. You've answered no questions about what happens when you interfere with the Indian Ocean and rain falls differently in Pakistan and they go through a nuclear war. I mean, it's, it's simply ridiculous and it's avoiding 
100% the real issues. Sorry about that, mate, but there you go. I, know, I, I would be very, very grateful to people who can point out the technical objections and difficulties. And certainly people in doing climate physics ought to be able to help and tell me where we shouldn't use this. Uh, but the, the, the uh, being able to control the temperature gradients across the Indian Ocean is actually a very, very wonderful thing you to be able to do because of the, uh, the resulting effects on the, the way the, the precipitation works. So this is giving us a chance to make things uh, alter in the way that we choose. The only thing you need to do is to get governments around the, the area to decide what they want the temperature pattern to be. It's pretty obvious if you want to reduce the, the chance of a hurricane in the Gulf of Mexico, but we do know, and I've got graphs from the Australian CSIRO about the effects of temperature gradients in the Indian Ocean on rainfall in both sides of the Indian Ocean. And they, it's further complicated by El Nino uh, effects. When you get El Nino and the Indian Ocean dipole combining, you can get really terrible things happening in Australia. Uh, and we can attack both of them. We can say, here is a nasty hot blob developing in this place off New Zealand, and we can move the fleets there and we can cool it down. And if we want to change our minds, it's one mouse click to stop them spraying and it's all forgiven and forgotten in half the meantime between rain showers. What we have is a system where we have a high frequency control, which is us, up to us to say whether we want to steer to the left or the right, whether we want it warmer or cooler, and we can prevent really terrible things happening, like the, the sort of um, typhoons you get in the Philippines. If the Philippines government could say they would like to have one and a half degrees Celsius less temperature on the, the, uh, the, the, the east side, they would be able to save thousands of lives. Uh, you shouldn't reject this just because it's another control. It's like having a steering wheel. Um, please let me know uh, uh, anything that you can about the climate physics. I, would, I quite believe that the places where it might work in a different direction, I know that some of them uh, will get a different direction, but these are places that we can identify and avoid. Your, I think your comments are very like the objections to uh, anaesthetics for women in childbirth. The top medics were very hostile to this idea, and it was actually Queen Victoria who said, I, I wish it to be known that I get anaesthetics when I'm giving birth. There were also similar objections to uh, giving vaccinations. Um, we, we, this is a wonderful tool that we might misuse but we might use to very good advantage dead silence <laughs> thank you dr salter all right any other questions jamin have you got it okay we have a comment from uh, melissa here sweetheart <laughs> okay I'm going to go for John, actually. <laughs> Hi, P Professor Salter. Thank you so much for the work you've been um, tirelessly working on. Um, I think the solution for me is called love and not coming from a place of anger. And I think questioning things is really good. Do you drive a car? No. OK, but but you we travel in cars and things. So. Well, no, but I'm just. Uh, poor Professor Salt is going to save, all, uh, save the world. <laughs> this is, I can't no, hear any of that. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so I think it's worth exploring um, these different avenues for um, bringing healing to the planet, whether it's planting trees. Here we've all come together um, as a family, even though we're coming from different backgrounds, different um, customs, traditions, languages, 
And um, I don't know if looking for solutions is, is what we're doing here, but we're starting to create a new world, whether we're here for another five years or another hundred years or even longer. But I don't see the problem in exploring ideas that could help the planet. Thank you. Like that gentleman. I'm an engineer. I've asked a series of technical questions. I have had none. Another great white savior who wants to do great white saving stuff. I'm sorry. You need to tune in to your inner, whatever it is, not your external great white savior, compassion, the pseudo compassion. I'm really offended. Okay. I don't recall any of the objections. Could you send me them again? And I'll see if I can reply to them. What we're doing is increasing the number of a very narrow range of drop sizes. The amount of spray we put up is a, a, about a thousandth of what's being thrown up at present by breaking waves in lots and lots of different sizes. And what we're doing is we're picking exactly the sweet highest that will give us the effect that we want. And you would have thought that being able to put sea surface temperatures back to the values that they used to have when we understood um, more, uh, we can get back to those values or we can get to other ones that wise people think would be an improvement. And being able to reduce the uh, problems of drought stricken areas by uh, this sort of changes looks to be a, a, a rather valuable thing. If we don't like it, we, it's one mouse click to stop the boat spraying and you're back to where you would have been in a few days. Uh, so it's, it's a very, very reversible technology. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you, Professor Salter. And thank you so much for your flexibility. And thank you everyone for your questions. We obviously have some follow up to do in, in the topics that have been raised and we'll pursue that uh, a bit later. And I have some things to say a bit later when it's my turn. And, uh, but for, for now, I think we've got Vincent, are you ready? Vincent up, Vincent's up next. Alrighty. Uh, Vincent has, is a young man who has, we have uh, had the honor and joy of collaborating with over about two and a half years now. And he has come up with some very exciting stuff in the realm of what I would, broadly call collective intelligence, communication, collaboration, community building. And with that, it's my pleasure to pass it to Vincent Arena. Vincent, take it away. Thank you to all the incredible leaders here today for both in your actions and your words being aligned with the people and the problems that have been the ones who have called us here to, to speak. As system scientist Danella Meadows once said, the purpose of any hierarchy is always to help its subsystems to do their jobs better. And in our current social and political systems, this really simple truth is sometimes easy to forget. This definition of good leadership must extend past just members of our companies and our nations, but also to the subsystems which we all depend on. The soil, the oceans, the air, and the biosphere, because without these systems, we are truly nothing. As our world becomes more globalized, it becomes more clear and COVID has shown us how we are all interconnected. And if our solutions to these problems, some of the ones we're talking about today, um, continue to make us more fragmented, then this is truly a recipe for disaster. The, the talk and the whole event today was about the relationships between the Choctaw Nation and the Irish peoples and how that reciprocity has been repaid during the COVID-19 pandemic. The solidarity and generosity across continents that has been at the core of today's event 
beautifully shows that collaboration, love, and coordinated action are the only ways that we stand a chance to create a better world for generations to come. So how might we better collaborate to create together a more regenerative and equitable future where we are resilient and prepared for the next crisis in the same way that I think the COVID relief fund is now transitioning into trying to uh, figure out how to make the Navajo and other First Nations more prepared for what comes next. How might we do so in a way that continues to transcend nationalities, disciplines, and languages, as well, of our, as well as our opinions, worldviews, and perspectives, which are all unique and are going to be needed as the diversity to help us actually come up with the right solutions that have the right balance between the different extremes. Whether in person here today, in this room, or in the Zoom room, or in any room hosted by Zoom or any other company, the same questions keep and constantly are emerging. Who is here? Who should I speak to first? Where are the ways that my unique gifts and talents can be applied to make the biggest difference? How am I being called to contribute? Where are the conversations happening that align with my personal mission, but also with our collective one? My name is Vincent Arena, and I'm the founder of Catalyst. Uh, my background is in engineering, and I am a systems designer and a post-pessimistic optimist. I've spent the last six years thinking about and experimenting with some of the answers or potential answers to these questions in helping communities become more organized and trying to encourage and reduce the barriers for collaboration at different scales. In the process, I've struggled with designing technology that is humane and ethical and that is not creating more problems than it's causing. Because after all, isn't it technology that has gotten us here in the first place? I know that's kind of a crazy take as an engineer, but if you think about it, a technology like the car um, has solved a lot of you know, important problems with helping us getting around and be more convenient, but it's also created the pollution, it's created the isolation in terms of how we design our neighborhoods. And so when we create any new technology, we have to think about do the positives outweigh the negatives and how do we create that technology so that it's human and planet first? We are social, intellectual, and spiritual beings. I believe that in the same way a once used piece of plastic product pollutes our seas, the constant stream of notifications and misinformation is polluting something else which I would call our information ecology. Instead of building gardens of knowledge, the largest tech platforms have chosen instead to profit off of our attention. And we're not the only ones who are drowning in this endless flood of novelty, of new information. Ironically, the purpose of these feeds, the business models behind all of our major social platforms is to sell us the aforementioned plastic and other products that we don't often need. These things are quite literally filling our oceans. So this really isn't a met metaphor, it's literal. And while simultaneously drains our own time and energy that we can be instead putting towards solving these problems. Although a stream of posts or tweets or news feeds wouldn't leave, a, leave us to believe it, many of our problems are the same ones that have plagued us for centuries. Climate change is an information problem and it's a collaboration problem and it's a human problem. And it's one that won't be solved with the same level of thinking that created it. So what if we designed our technology, but more importantly, we also educated the people using it in order to highlight what connects us and what we share in common instead of dividing us. Catalyst is attempting to build a foundation of connected knowledge. Think of it like a series of libraries 
with the goal of connecting people to opportunities to catalyze action, whether that be a book, a partner for starting a mutual aid group, or finding a press conference in Cork, Ireland. But a library without people to discuss those ideas and figure out what actions to take is not really doing much for us. And so that's what brings us here today, to have conversations. The Catalyst event platform is what we've been using to power the digital repository for this conference. Uh, and it allows us to help find what has happened in the past, what's happening right now, and also what will happen in the future. And so I'm gonna quickly go through how we can use it to catalyze the incredible voices of the people here today and anyone listening into Zoom and how to host your own conversation this week in the following three days of the Garden of Conversations, which is going to be the continued um, effort of this conference so that we can uh, really highlight the voices that need to be heard and have these really critical conversations to be able to figure out how we move forward together. All right, let's see if this works. Okay, so I'm going to the event calendar. Can you guys see my screen? Okay, great. Okay, so for anyone who has not already found their way to the agenda, it is on the calendar starting today. Okay, so when you first land on the event page, you'll see a link to join the event. This is gonna be the main Zoom room where Marco, who I just wanna give a huge shout out to, who has been handling all of the craziness from today behind the scenes, he is one of the real stars, um, is managing. Yeah, I think we can give it up for Marco. So this main Zoom room will be where people will help direct you to the different events. And BJ. And BJ as well, yes. Thank you, BJ. So this Zoom room will be um, open for the next three days. So if you don't know where to go, you could just click join event and go there. Um, you can also scroll down to the agenda by clicking on the top agenda or scrolling down. And this will have a calendar on the top right corner. You can switch between the different views here. And so this will have the calendar of all of the conversations that are happening over the next three days. As you can see, some conversations are happening at the same time, and so it might be hard to choose which one to join, but clicking on any one of these will pop up a, uh, a little preview of the event, a uh, description, and then a link to join. These will also have the videos of the recordings of these events after they're finished and any calls to action of how you can actually get involved with the various projects and presentations that are happening. There's also a list of links. If you were in person at the Kindred Spirit ceremony, you can upload your photos. Um, if you would like to contribute to the ongoing COVID-19 relief fund, uh, there will be a list of actions and links here on the event page, as well as on kindredspirits.earth. And if you'd like to explore the bios of the various speakers that presented today and figure out how to contact them, you can go to the featuring and you can uh, explore here and clicking on any one of the um, speakers will show you their bios and also the presentations that uh, they will be sharing. In addition, let's see. There's also a check-in map, so if you'd like to RSVP and check in, you can explore all the people who have virtually dialed into this event and where they're coming from and the answer to the question, what unique gift you have that can help save, heal, and transform life on Earth. So I think that's it for me. I just want to say thank you to everyone for allowing me this opportunity to support this initiative and the ongoing conversations happening this week. And if there are any questions on how to sign up or submit a presentation, um, please post them here in the, in the comments um, or uh, 
just jump into the Zoom room. We'd be happy to help. There's a link here to click sign up to host a conversation. So if you have an idea that you would like to talk about or a conversation you'd like to start, we'd love to see you in the next three days. Thank you. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you, Vincent. Any questions for Vincent, either in the Zoom room or here in the conference room? Yes, we have a question here. Um, I think we're wanting to put the link there. Go ahead, Shannon. Um, Thank you so much. Vincent, you've done a masterful job. Thank you so much for all the work that you've done. I'm grateful that all of this has happened so that you can showcase uh, your brilliance and put it to good use. Uh, what I'd like to ask is, um, what's the link? <laughs> uh, I think I've got it, but I don't think that, uh, you know, I, I want to make sure that everybody has that link. Uh, so if you could put that into the chat, uh, that would be amazing. Thank you so much, Vincent. Can you hear me? Okay, yes. so the link, you can go to kindredspirits.earth and write on the main homepage. Um, and actually, can BJ or Marco, if you could screen share the kindredspirits.earth site, so that way everyone could see. And if not, I can probably, let's see. Yeah, it's coming. Give me a second. Thank you, Marco. No worries. Okay, are we are we seeing my screen? Yes, beautiful. Could you just refresh the page? I think we made some updates. Yeah. So yeah, Marco posted the link to kindredspirits.earth. And then if you stop right there, Marco, there's the three green buttons. So the full agenda on Catalyst here. If you click that, it'll link to the full agenda for the coming three days. And that's also where you'll find the link to sign up to present. And we'll also be uh, tonight embedding the calendar on the kindredspirits.earth site as well. And Marco, if you click on the top agenda, it'll scroll all the way down there for you. So you just have to scroll down a little bit and agenda will pop up on the top. And if you click it, it'll scroll down there for you. Oh, I'm not. Do you see all the way on the top bar, Marco? It's, um, you have to scroll down a bit. <laughs> okay, there, this one, there it is, it's in red. Yes, there we go. so there's the agenda. So you can see all the different conversations. You can see the start and end time. Some of these are going to be in our main Zoom room and other ones are going to be in a different Zoom room. So if you click on the presentation that you or the conversation you are interested in, then you'll see a link to join and that will take you to the right Zoom room. And if you're ever lost, uh, you can always go back to the main main Zoom room, which is on the kindred spirits earth site or um, right on the top of Catalyst. Did anyone else have any other questions? Uh, hello, this is BJ. I have a question about, um, I don't know if it's still the same, but that you put kindredspirits.earth in the bar at the top, but not on Google. So that's the way you find it. Just put it in the, the, the bar at the top. Yes, okay. correct. Thank you, I don't see any other questions here. Yeah, I, I have a, a comment that I really enjoyed your presentation, especially about the collaboration and how we get people to even be interested or come together 
to have conversation and to collaborate. But we also know now that we're all interconnected, totally interconnected. We seem to be separate, but we're not. And the more that we come into resonance, the different vibrational levels of our being, that we're changed. And so the collaboration would be linked with greater resonance, greater integration of our own being, and a higher order of our own self. And that is what is being potentiated here. And it's already in action because people have been having dreams, inspirations, visions, synchronistic meetings. Uh, there are very many has a, a, many multidimensional forces at work here. And we tend to work in sort of a more two dimensional kind of thinking. And that's sort of the old paradigm. But we're actually being changed. I mean, we are being changed very profoundly right now. So I'm looking forward to more conversation and and the discovery of more invitation so that there can be more collaboration and thank you for developing this these communication networks and these tools the world wide web is a whereas it has its i guess negative sides but it's actually a jewel you know it is a jewel right now so like we are all jewels but we're not interconnected jewels as yet but we're getting we're coming there Yeah, please, please. Hi, everyone. My name is Anita, and I'm from Middleton. I do a lot of um, ceremonies. I might have to sit down because I want to read something from my phone in a minute. I do a lot of ceremonies over at the Kindred Spirits Monument. Um, we had our Imbolc um, Bridge, St. Bridget's Day celebrations over there. But um, like what Mary just said, it's all about interconnecting ourselves and getting back to the land, you know. And lately, with all the fear, and I think there's a lot of fear, but I have a message of hope here that I'd like to read out from somebody I've been following. Vandava Shiva is her name, and I really admire her. So, but I, I need to read it. Is that okay? Vandava Shiva is an environmental activist who made it her mission to fight against the trend of genetically engineered foods. Her background is in physics and her Vedic culture and the decades she spent creating seed banks to shape her, her pragmatic view of the climate crisis and her fuel of a hopeful outlook. Climate change may be wreaking havoc on the world, but environmental activists Vandava Shiva believes we should have hope that humanity can fight ecological crisis. Trends that are beyond our power are something that we cannot change, but trends that are triggered by human irresponsibly, on irresponsibility can be changed by human care when it comes to the environment and the climate. For more than 30 years, Shiva has campaigned to pro promote biodiversity, especially, sorry, I'm nervous. <laughs> especially in her home country of India and the nearby nation of Bhutan, where she helped create 122 seed banks to preserve species. But preserving the environment is no easy feat, according to a recent report from the World Wildlife Fund. Between 1970 and 2014, the world lost 60% of its wild species. The only way to maintain these diminished ecosystems and avoid further decline would be to prevent global temperatures from increasing by 0.5 degrees. 
it is enormous it's an enormous undertaking that would require international cooperation coordinated policy change according to the report despite those challenges shiva said she doesn't allow herself to succumb to hopelessness i don't think we have the option for despair shiva says hope is something we cultivate in our daily consciousness through our daily actions shiva explained that it takes a lot of practice to cultivate hope one way to begin is to reflect on the intimate relationship between the environment and our everyday lives while biodiversity may not seem like a problem for people the disappearance of species can ne negatively impact food production for example between 2000 and 2018 roughly 150 livestock breeds have gone extinct across the world one way to keep your attention on the value of agriculture is to look at food as a sacrament in the way many cultures and faiths do so everyone who's feeling a little hopelessness needs to get engaged and turning bread into a sacrament at every day every meal says shiva as we call as as our cultures teach us we say thank you to the bread thank you to the creator thank you to those who grew it if each of us just became conscious in our eating and became engaged in the political and social activism to recognize that in our daily bread it's an interconnectedness of care for the earth and care for the community it is in the link between ecological action as well as social justice action and health action and political action it's all in the food that we eat two or three times a day we can find deep peace in the midst of climate crisis by shifting what we focus on and what actions we take my joy comes from the awareness that i am part of this amazing earth i am part of this amazing universe and the next step is to build up of joy which comes from flowing with the plant the plants that are laid out in front of us you can call them ecological paths we can look at the collapse and the, we can look at the collapse and despair and say oh my god we are going over the precipice or you can take the one seed and plant it and ask everyone everyone around you to grow their own seeds of change seeds of joy seeds of freedom and seeds of hope thank you thank you very much thank you beautiful All right. It's you. Oh, it, it, indeed, it's uh, it's I'm up next and I've been sitting here writing notes and preparing for what I was going to say, but I'm going to put all that down because I just realized I love what Ejna just said on the fly uh, way better than I want to hear uh, Jamin Shively saying what I was going to say. So I'll stand up at the podium because Stephanie is inviting me up to the podium, but as soon as I get up here, I'm going to sit back down because what I propose is to hear this, that instead of me just blabbing on and saying whatever, whatever I was going to say, that we just have a conversation. So please grab the microphone whenever you feel like it, and let's just talk. Because what we're doing here, um, and I'm going to defer to Mary, who's grabbing the mic, um, that what we're doing here is something amazing. And we haven't quite figured out how to do it yet, but like the kid shooting hoop, you know, air ball after air ball, oh, boom, it hit the rim. Hey, one of them actually went in. That's how you get good at something, and that's what we're doing here. We're shooting hoop in the realm of conversation, in the realm of coming together. Mary. Hello. It's um, <clears throat> listening in on this conversation and, you know, being here for this purpose, it is profound. We understand that, you know, there is little time to correct a lot of global issues a lot of hurt, a lot of destruction that needs to be undone. And as much as we say that it may be too late, I think that we still have time. 
to make an impact. We still have, um, you know, so much that we can do. We are, we have all come together here and, you know, we, we're all sharing a room and we hope that we can reach many people um, and they can hear our plea for help and to hear us and to understand where we're coming from. But our, you know, there, there is, there's, you know, the GMOs, you know, food that are genetically modified so that, um, you, you know, we, they can make more quantity and the quality is not there. Um, you know, we get a lot of that on the, on the reservation. Um, we're given the poorest quality, um, you know, uh, mass production of uh, the cheapest amount. Um, you know, there's, um, as well as, yeah, a lot of um, chemical colors that we um, ingest that are harmful to our bodies, that our people do not, that are not aware of. And we don't know any better. We're not, many of the elders and many of the children are not educated on that yet. And my hope is that we can get through to folks, um, get through to many people so that we can, you know, start, start sharing, start sharing what it is that we need to do to, to continue this um, fight for um, human beings, human nature. And, you know, um, I lost my train of thought, but, you know, just really, you know, I'm glad to be here at this moment in time we need to hear these. We need to continue this conversation. Um, uh, you know, my there's only a, a selected few. There's a you know a cousin that shares these stories with me, and that is one of the reasons why I'm aware of these. And um, thank goodness for social media. I know it takes up some carbon footprint and stuff, but you know it gives much needed information and um we hope that we can continue um teaching our youth about all our um you know every, how everything affects us so i just we just wanted to reiterate what everybody's saying and just confirm that yes i'm ready to listen and i hope many are ready to listen So I always start in my language. And because my parents are from different nations, I have a couple of choices. But I generally start this way so that the invisible powers hear me the same as everybody else. I don't think I'm so powerful that I don't need the help of the invisible powers of the world. That's colossal hubris. And humanity has accidentally taken up a little colossal hubris. So that's a shift that's required. Well, the first time a girl has her moon, the first time a boy starts to grow hair in places he didn't before, that's a colossal shift in your hormones, in your physicality, in the way you relate to the world. And that's where the way that our people talk about this and talk about the prophecies that go with this time that we're in, that colossal shift is what we're in right now. So nobody jumped down here by accident. That's the other thing we're taught. You didn't get here by accident. Didn't come here by accident. 
You didn't turn on your Facebook by accident and hunt for the link to get here by accident. You didn't put yourself in a corner and think and talk about how how what can you personally do with the skills that you understand yourself to have by accident the way you talk about it they say what you need is you need your mind turned around we need our minds turned around they say they told me something they turned my mind around what they mean by that what they mean by that is that we look at ourselves and the world from a different place the inside the moment we forget that we are integrally related to the circle of life, we have stepped outside. It doesn't make us less related. It just makes us less conscious. Well, if you're ordering in a restaurant, consciousness will get you to the hospital real quick, right? right? So a little consciousness goes a long way or you'll miss the bus if you're not conscious of how it runs, eh? Simple things. You miss a meeting you're supposed to be at with your boss and oh boy, pull up. So let's think about that applied consciousness that is being called for from the world we are in at this time. Because it's being called for at every level. There's no insignificant gift. The singers have to sing. That addresses one kind of energy in the world. The engineers have to create. That addresses another kind of energy in the world. The fabric makers have to sew and design. That addresses another kind of energy in the world. Sometimes we get lost. That's a two-legged thing. I don't get it, but we do. Sometimes we get lost because there's no insignificant movement, action, being, gift, responsibility, or obligation to do your piece in the world that helps that wheel to turn, that helps that Mother Earth to go. Because if you cut your grass too short and it dries up, you know what happens to your soil. But that grass, if it's not feeding you, if the plants that grow out of your grass aren't feeding you, they're feeding the animals that are feeding you. If you sound pollute the Pacific, then the animals that remember the things we need to know in the world are harmed by that. And then we don't get that knowledge because we're just beginning to learn how to talk and to listen to those beings that don't have two-legged languages. There it is again, that accidental, incredible hubris that we don't need. <laughs> and in our traditional cultures, and when I speak about that, I'm not just talking about Native American cultures or Canadian, Native Canadian cultures or South American cultures, or I'm talking about Earth cultures because this country right here, the reason we're in relationship is because of an incredible history, a shared history of, a, of cultures that are connected to the earth, of cultures that are fundamentally within, working with the cycles of the earth and struggling for lack of integrating that into our lives. Yeah, sometimes that's a government. Well, that's what that is. Yeah, sometimes it's just you or me seeing myself as separate from Mother Earth. I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to do that. My kids don't know how to do that. My grandkids don't know how to do that. The truth is none of us knows how to do that. It's an accidental choice. That means it's as accidental means it's a, an unconscious choice. And so applied Consciousness is what we're talking about here at every level. The same scientists that we revere mightily for the principles we understand about the earth, I think about Einstein, I think about 
I mean, not just people of past, it's just that Einstein's a, one of my many personal favorites. They're the same ones who were the first to say, you know, I really don't know anything, but this is how this appears to move. And so let's try So let's see how this works, because this is what keeps happening. And they studied Mother Earth. They studied Mother Earth with incredible childlike curiosity and love and compassion. And it's easy to get caught through the process of becoming more human, more two-legged. It's easy to get caught in all the, the transitions because also we've forgotten to honor them. I won't embarrass anybody by saying who here's actually had a puberty ceremony, but everybody should. Not because I think so, but because even if that's the, the, a feast in your village that, you know, or a party in your house that celebrates your shifting from child to adolescent, that's a powerful recognition because it's the village, the people looking back at you and seeing you. And fundamentally, like all things living and market, all things are alive. Fundamentally, every, everything longs to be seen. Everyone longs to be heard. And the more frustrating that is, as you're not, the likelier you are to feel disconsolate or disconnected. And then we see the kind of thing that we saw not, to, not so many days ago in the States where children take the lives of their own peers. We need to pay attention to those things. And we need to be building. My mother had a saying, she used to say, she said, don't cry, build. She didn't mean that meanly. She meant use it, use it. Don't pretend, don't stuff away that, that, that struggle like it's not there. She said, convert that energy, use it. Make something beautiful, because it's all supposed to be beautiful. That is the birthright of humanity and everything living. It's too good for me to make up. Our prophecies have been talking about that for centuries, not just ours, all over the earth. Almost every, I traveled a little, almost every earth-based culture I've ever come across their stories say the same thing. They trust the sound more than paper because you can't, you can't, there are five, there are seven things you cannot express on paper. And that's why we sing. That's why we sing. And the people who sing and talk to their plants, do you know the difference? The people who sing when they plant their plants, do you know the difference? Because we are vibrational beings. Again, ask a physicist, too good for me to make up. As vibrational beings, everything we say and do affects everything around us. That's why we feel it when somebody comes at us out of their own frustration and fires back. That's why we feel it. They feel it too. Let us become conscious in our expression. Let us become listeners, because that's really the only way that we can hear the quiet as well as the loud, the subtleties of vibration, the things that don't communicate in language words of two leggeds. That listening happens all over Mother Earth. And every other being, to quote my husband's people, Haudenosaunee people, every other living being on this Earth follows and knows their original instructions. Two ligates were given what my brother Clyde calls the divine gift of free will and the responsibility to be the caretaker of that. That's why we call ourselves first people, not just because we're the first in a place 
or original in a place. But we're First Nations because it's our responsibility to, I don't know, is shepherd the right word? I don't know, maybe it's a little part of the right word, to care for, to caretake, to be in communion with, to listen to, to hear, to love and be loved by. Because if you're not listening, you're not going to hear that teeny tiny, I love you. I love you. That comes from everything around us. I think my, my mom and my grandmas would say, turn your face to the sun. We need to turn our faces to the sun as it rises there. We need to turn our faces there and pay attention to that light and absorb that and all that goes with it so that we are enabled for the day, that's not the right word, charged for the day, and that's not the right word either. English, gotta learn it. <laughs> so that we are fed for the day with the energy and the wisdom and the stillness to go through the madness that we have managed to generate <laughs> as, as a human family. It's not that we are being asked by creation to be less two-legged, we're being asked to be a whole lot more. We're being asked to be full 100% two-legged nation and that's, that includes a whole invisible realm that very, not enough people yet take care of, touch, listen to. But I'll bet there's not a person in this room that doesn't have stories about how they went down one street instead of the other because it didn't feel right, and it was a nasty accident the way they didn't go. Or how they thought they, they bent down to pick up something on the street, and when they looked up, no, it was, it was, my brain goes a five pound note. I said, God, you're old. <laughs> it, there's not one of us who hasn't felt that baby cry before it cries. There's not one of us because we have those invisible senses. And if I have an offering for this in any way, shape or form, it is to encourage us to find a way to still our minds and our hearts and open our ears. My grandma would say this. Get it? Yeah. She says it better than me. <laughs> and she says it without words. Every time it goes right, celebrate that something went in a good way. Find something to celebrate every day. Listen for what's next. Listen with consciousness so that you don't just randomly do what happens to run through your mind in the moment. Because lots of things will talk to you now, especially since we passed. Prophecies say that in 20, by 2001, all of the fields of protection around Mother Earth, because she needs to expand to change, were lifted. And so there's a lot more stuff able to get through than there used to be. But those are stories for another day. It doesn't matter if you know how it happened. It matters what you're going to do about it, right? That's why we came, right? Let's find ways to work at that. Well, you know, it's been so wonderful to be here with everybody and to see all the relatives and to hear everybody speaking. And I really pray that, that uh, if, again, that this manifests into something that we know uh, has been prayed for and prophesied, which is coming together as one human family. So I want to sing this song. It's a song from our white buffalo calf woman who came around 900 uh, AD, according to my dear Tahashi, Kevin Locke, one of our great historians. 
And she brought many songs and teachings and ceremonies and her songs and her teachings, like in the Bible, but they're in her songs. And so this one is the, you might say the foundation song. And it says, first it says, Wayankie. Wayankie means to call upon the power of the God, to call upon the power of the great spirit, to call upon the power of the creator, to behold this. And then it's when you're preparing a sacred pipe, but what it says is that the bowl what represents the mineral people, the power of cohesion or unity, that's sacred. And the plant people, which represent the, the stem, have the power of growth and are one with the mineral people. And then the animal people who contain the mineral people, which give them their substance and their unity and bones and so forth. And then they have the power of growth like the plant people. And they also have the power of the senses, so highly developed in so many ways. And then we have our human being. We, we are one with the mineral people. They make up our bones and our blood. We're one with the plant people. We have the spirit and power of growth and they breathe in carbon dioxide and breathe out oxygen. And we're, we're, we have a reciprocal relationship, a symbiotic relationship where you do all things. And then we have come to ourselves, human beings. We have this part of ourselves, the soul, the soul that transcends this world of time and space, the soul that is never, whatever happens to this body never dies. The soul, which always remembers any loved one that we've ever loved in this physical world of time and space will not be forgotten the spiritual worlds to come. So this is what that song says. Behold, the mineral, the plant, the animal, the human, all is sacred. All is holy. All is sacred. So I'll sing this closing song in, in, in thoughtfulness and all the wonderful relatives here, those we can see in the unseen world and those in the unseen world because the unseen world is filled, filled with those relatives who are awaiting us to arise, especially the young people, especially elders, especially all of us to fulfill our complete potentiality. <laughs> Why on the 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 I'll save those last two verses for a little bit later. I'll be chante wash day alo shuk mono he may it out you know pas up and oh how me chante wash day. I hope I hope have a beautiful evening, beautiful dream. All of us. Thank you, Chief Phil. And thank you, Marco, BJ, Michael, Franca, all the volunteers. Too many to, to, to name one by one. We, um, we're, I love how Chief Phil says we are all one human family and we are all indigenous sisters and brothers of Mother Earth. Beautiful. Yep. Thank you for that. Thank you for that beautiful closing. Chief Phil. And thank you all. Thank you all so much for being here. Love you all so much. Thank you.